I'm going to talk about boring these RD350 cylinders out and just talk about a few things that I'm thinking about when I'm taking my measurements and going to the process. Uh, but first, a little background. These came from a guy. Really cool. I, I like a kindred spirit to me. I met him out in Nashville. I have a GT750 that I've carried around for about five years. And I'm stuck on the crank with it. Still stuck on the crank five years later. He had a whole engine that he was selling. Uh, Craigslist, I believe it was. And I went and met him. I, was like, I couldn't believe that someone else is fascinated with this stuff like I am. Now, these RDs are getting gobbled up because everyone's realizing how badass they are. They have reed cages. You know, uh, I've got a Kawasaki triple, the Suzuki's. They're all gutless compared to the, the uh, Yamaha RDs. They just have some magic formula about extracting the most power out of it with that reed cage. So these were really the fastest. The 350s, the 400s, they will stomp the 400 Kawasaki. Um, you know, the only other replacement for that is displacement. So you get into the H1s. But, okay, some of you may not agree with me, but for some reason the RDs were just... I even had a 200 one time electric start. Sweet little motorcycle. Um... Let's get back to the, the subject there. Sorry for the tangent. We've got his piston here. And he has a clearance of one thousandth with another four. Well, this would be one and a half thousandths of a clearance, which is really tight. And that is for a brand new piston only. After this breaks in, that clearance, you can throw that out the window. You're probably going to see something more like two to three thousandths clearance. And that's because this is an air-cooled engine. you got a lot of it, things expanding. There's also ribs on these. You can hear it as I run my finger down, like a fingernail file. Those ribs are there designed to wear into the motor. So that first break-in when you get these things back from your machine shop, that break-in is so important. Um, the other death knell for uh, two strokes is when the rings expand into these ports after a cylinder's been bored. If your machinist doesn't sit there and take these sharp edges off after cutting in here, those rings will catch a port because it's got to. These pass those openings, and if a ring catches that, it'll chip the piston, and you just threw all your money away. I don't know how hard it is to find these. This is probably a second over piston. Uh, how hard it is to find for the RDs. They're getting more popular. That stuff, I know first overs are always gone. Um... That's a myth I'd like to dispel here too. I like to do second over first time. The reason for that is if you try to do everything in one over increments, you're gonna cheat yourself. If you're gonna get probably two good bores out of stock size pistons, go ahead and skip half steps because you're removing enough material to get a nice, straight, clean bore with one cut. Um, I'm going to set this up on my machine in a minute. Mine's a little unique. Most people use a Norman style uh, boring bar where clamping tables are here. You have to remove the studs and all that. This thing is designed specifically for motorcycle pistons or cylinders. And uh, it's kind of cool, but the work is few and far between. So there's no career here in it. Let's take some measurements and I'll explain what I'm looking for. All right. Considering piston design, what you want to look for is the widest part on the piston. It's always going to be more narrow at the crown or the top of the piston and wider at the skirt. A lot of pistons, modern pistons, they can sometimes even be elongated, like egg-shaped from this direction. And that's because of the thermal expansion rates of more mass. You always have more mass in the webs or the pin bosses because it needs that support. There's also more mass at the top of the piston because that's doing all the work. Let's say you're hitting this with a fire hammer. So we know from experience that the widest portion is going to be perpendicular to the pin boss and at the skirt. And I will prove that now. This clearance is going to be one and a half thousandths. We're not going to use calipers to measure this piston. We're going to use a micrometer. But just for sake of video and speed of use, I'm going to use these. So moderate force, zero out. We're going to measure, just bury this part of your caliper into this cutout and get it square. Run it down. We've got 2555. 2555. Five, five, five. 
Let's go all the way to the end of the skirt. Two five five five. Let just for sake of measuring stuff, let's go to the top. I'll show you the difference. Two five four six in inches. That is because. So this piston is shaped like a wedge, right? The head being more narrow. As this piston expands, the skirt is thin. It's going to expand first. And it's not going to expand much because there's not much mass there. The head, being so thick, is going to expand more slowly. And it's going to expand more proportionally to the skirt. They've also factored in that the only contact points on a piston, once it's running, really is the skirt and the piston rings. So this is clearanced. This is clearanced for expansion and the difference here on the skirt. You don't want to get that. That's the dance, right? You want to get it tight enough to where when it wears in, it's going to be in spec after you've honed it, but you don't want to get it too loose to where this piston will slap. If you hear a worn out two stroke, you'll never forget the sound. It's like someone's shaking a box of marbles. The, the piston being supported by the rings that that's really the the focus of the the power and and where all your power comes from and your compression and all that is the ring area right that's the contact that's very important the other contact area that's secondary to that is the skirt touching the cylinder and that's keeping the piston square in the bore if this was worn out or overboard your rings are going to expand into that bore so you'll still have compression but what you'll start to develop is as the crank comes up, the piston will tip back and forth. And it goes tick, 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 tick over and over again. Let's see, one more thing I want to talk about, just because I got it here and it's a good example, is these two holes. These guys right here are to control the intake timing. There's always an arrow or a mark or something on a piston, like two stroke. See that little arrow right there? That tells you that that goes towards the exhaust, and this is the intake side of the skirt. These holes are what control intake timing. So as this piston moves up and down and uncovers different ports on that cylinder, it allows fuel to enter the crankcase or across the top through transfer ports into the engine. So these are very important distances from top of the piston, uncovering and covering the exhaust port, to the skirt bottom and in this case these cutouts is for intake timing that's just, i'm sure a lot of you guys and the one girl that's watching this already knew that but while we got it here let's take a look measuring this with the micrometer and that's the area that we previously determined was the largest diameter that could possibly be had on a cold piston we've got two five 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 we lucked out that confirms what we found with the calipers, but you cannot trust calipers for something like this. These things, I would probably go a thousandth estimation with these, all right? So we got 2555.5 plus our clearance that we want is one and a half thousandths. Add that up, we got 2557. 2557. So that is the bore that we need to run down these cylinders. Let's go over to the machine and I'll show you how to set that up. Here's the machine, approximately 1980s cycle sill bore master. Not like a Van Norman bar where earlier I mentioned that you have to remove studs for those because they clamp the cylinder and hold it real tight. A lot of machinists don't favor this machine for that reason because the clamps on this machine hold at two small points on the side of the table but I favor it for another reason and I discussed that earlier that this thing is designed just for motorcycle cylinders you can use those little points to go in between studs where if you send this out to someone that does blind boring or someone that does other types of hole boring you have to remove your studs you're gonna break studs you're gonna have trouble they'll send Potentially, I'm not accusing anyone, but you could send your cylinder out with the studs, then you get it back with no studs at all. You got to find studs, right? So try to find somebody for your motorcycle cylinder that has a motorcycle cylinder boring bar. 
you can't replace specific tools. Other tools will do the job, a lathe could do the job, but how can you beat a machine built for that purpose? First thing we're gonna do is clean this up. I used it not long ago. It's gotta be perfectly clean. This mating surface has to have no speck of dust on it. Bring our cylinder over to our clean platen. I'm gonna first remove the bit from last time. This is the part that scares me. I don't know if it scares most machinists. I'd be interested to see in the comments if anybody else does this. The first cut on a cylinder is always the sketchiest or scariest part for me because you wanna try and get everything centered. You're gonna run this machine for any length of time. You better have a handful of these M58 screws because they wear out all the time. And they go in here. Well, let's set up a cylinder. This surface is clean. These parallel bars, one, two, three blocks. We're gonna place these down here. Earlier, I mentioned that you don't have to remove the studs for this machine, and that will be evident here shortly. I'm gonna put it with the base down. Um, also make sure this base gasket surface doesn't have any gasket left and is nice and clean. So that goes like that. These clamps are set up but loose, so we can kind of give it a wiggle, let it find its home, put a little tension on each side, and then tune in Tokyo. But let's pull the centering cone off and re-clock it just a little bit. And the reason I do that is when I tighten this up again, you can watch if the quill moves over. If it does, you're not center. That looks pretty good. Let's pretty cool. use it like a slide hammer to get it out. It's a special indicator. And then you put your bit in with the cutting edge going away from you. Um, here's my edge design. A lot of relief on both sides and a pretty large radius. That has a lot to do with your finish. If you use 65 degree bits, um, you're going to end up with lines in your cylinder. So this is a grind that I've kind of developed into. Some uh, back rake. Okay, let's put that in like so. Then you have a shim, just a softer piece of metal. So that the screws have something to bite into. You're going to slide your bit forward until it touches your micrometer. So that is slid in at 2555. And you'll tighten your screws. Like so. So before we go and hog out, a 20 thousandths pass. Let's see where where we are, where we're at. I'll bring this up into the bore. And we're going to push the bit. These grub screws are loose enough to where there's drag, but we're going to push the bit into the cylinder wall pretty firmly, then bring it back up. Tighten that screw just a little more. Let's see our starting point. So we're starting with two, five, two, six. So by running that down, just as you center and you do like a one thousandth pass, just to see the shape of the cylinder, this reveals the wear. 
you can see that it's contacting this area fine all the way till you get about half well that's about a quarter way down and around this port how slick it is there's also an area in this top portion where the bit wasn't touching but then it started to touch down here and that is the intake side and this is the exhaust side and down here at the skirt there's a clean spot just below this transfer port but then it touches again until you get to the cutouts so that's kind of if, if you were to measure this you would see these being but this is physical proof or visual proof of how the shape of a board changes over time i like everything i saw on the test pass that we're square we're looking good um, i'm going to go ahead and make the first cut we're going to probably divide this distance into half because i like to cut about twenty thousandths per pass but there's not enough there's not forty thousandths to cut so let's do this pass at two five three eight that's two five three eight and then we'll get one more to our final dimension don't leave the machine when you first start cutting if you get chatter you can turn it off and that's cutting good cutting pass cleaning up everything all right so we've made our last pass Check our diameter here, 2549925550. That's perfect. That's what we measured our piston at. And we're gonna hone the clearance. Should go to about the wrist pin. Perfect. We'll take this off and hone it. Here's our honing tool. Uh, it's not my favorite one. I've got another one that I like a little better. These are Lyle. Okay, it's a Sunnen style hone. And this one's range is up to 2.7 inches. My other one starts at 2.75, so I've got to use this one, which it works pretty good. It's just a little more petite. I'm going to use the largest stone set I have. I go in like that. And you alternate stone to wiper. We're gonna use 180 grit stone. And I discussed this earlier, but I'm shooting for the middle. We've only got to remove two thousandths, which is not a lot of material. That I, that first thousandths comes at almost the first pass. It'll take three adjustments of this, I'm guessing, to get one and a half thousandths, or the, the two thousandths that I need for one and a half thousandths clearance. <laughs> Whew! If you're not good with numbers, <laughs> write stuff down. So welcome to Critter Corner. This is the nastiest place, and I would never put a parts washer indoors. Start by cleaning the bore, and I drop it down in the honing hole to do that. And take my Afro brush and just wipe the cylinder down, getting the grit out. That grit can be pretty abrasive. Put our cowl colon gloves on. Adjusted these out until the stones are touching and firm. This is something that you just gotta get a feel for. If you get it too tight, you won't be able to hold the drill or the cylinder. So you've got to, you know, the first pass, just get it snug and run it through. It's gonna remove a lot of material right off the bat. You also gotta keep your arm moving up and down. Try to keep an even rate. I do about half trigger and I end up with 45 degree cross hatching, which I'll show you here in a minute. So that's our first set of 30 strokes. Let's measure it. These are snap gauges, Tom. Fourth time I've stopped and measured everything. Um, let's see what we got. Nice pattern. It's 
scooping it out with an outdoor brush. I right, go ahead and chamfer these on camera. You've got to take these horizontal lines and put some sort of radius on them because the rings as they pass will catch that edge. So I'm gonna use a Dremel tool with a fine stone and just be as careful as possible to get the most angle that I can. You want about 45 degrees. <laughs> 